I'm Nate Eaton here in the EastIdahoNews.com studio with the prosecutor, the Bonneville County prosecutor, Danny Clark. Uh, you have a big case right now. Brian Drips, who was arrested last week in connection to the Angie Dodge murder case. So we have a, a couple of questions for you about that, as well as Chris Tapp will try to tackle both of those issues. First, uh, Mr. Drips appears in court Monday. Maybe by the time you watch this, he will have appeared in court. What happens from here? As his initial appearance here in court, he'll be advised of, his, of the charges, his rights, and they'll begin scheduling the, the upcoming hearings. And so that'll occur today. Uh, the next process will be a preliminary hearing. Usually that's done within a couple of weeks. On a case like that, that usually takes a couple of months. Explain to people what a preliminary sure. hearing is. Preliminary hearing, when someone's charged by a complaint, which is what was done here, uh, he has the right to challenge the evidence within 14 days, generally. Uh, and that is where the state must show there's probable cause that he committed the crime. So it's kind of like a little mini trial. As a prosecutor, the fact that you have a confession, apparently, and you have a DNA match, apparently. Is that like a slam dunk case for you? Well, I'm not, as it relates to Mr. Drips, I gotta be careful. Um, I can't speak about any of the evidence as it relates to Mr. Drips. He has the constitutional right to a fair trial. And I've gotta make sure and adhere to that and make sure others do as well. So my comments will be, will be limited. There's some evidence that is part of the public forum right now um, you know, we made sure that information was in the probable cause statement, and that's public record. And so there's some things that are known, but you know, any, any specific details or commentary on, on him, I just don't want to go into, if that's okay. So this is a case that would qualify for the death penalty, right? Yes, it does. And have you thought about whether you're going to pursue that? Sure. We have thought about it. We've, we've discussed it. Um, I have to make that decision 60 days after his arraignment in district court. So after the preliminary hearing phase and, and after his arraignment in district court, uh, that, that decision has to be made a short time before that. Uh, that'll be done with a lot of thought and consideration, uh, probably most specifically a lot of consideration about what the victim's family uh, would like to see. I think at, at this stage, on a case like this, on any case like this, uh, the victim's family um, ought to have a lot of say in that matter, and so we'll certainly be in consultation with them in that regard. But, but that, that decision, oftentimes, as I've done in the past, uh, sometimes we have filed that notice of intent to seek the death penalty, because that has to be done so early on in the, fa in the case, uh, but later on, by virtue of whatever, uh, we may decide not to. So oftentimes, we've got to let folks know we might, um, only to change that later on. But at this point, it's something that certainly has to be considered on this case. Uh, but that decision won't be made until, until a lot of conversations happen between my office and uh, the Dodge family. Where were you when you found out that he had been arrested and, according to the probable cause, confessed to the crime? This has been in the works for a while. Um, uh, I was informed last you know, Friday they had gotten a sample. I knew they were going to get one. Uh, I was informed a week ago, Saturday night, uh, that, that, that it was a match, you know, and everybody got pretty excited. We got together on a week ago Monday, a week ago today, uh, and they put together a tactical plan. Uh, I was in Boise at the time of the interview. Uh, when the takedown occurred, I met those folks, or the detectives at the law enforcement building there in Caldwell, and I was in the, during the interview, there is a video feed to the recording equipment. And uh, me and my chief deputy, John Dewey, were sitting in the interview room, or I'm sorry, in the video room, watching the interview as it played out. Mm, wow. So that's where I was. And I drove home late that night. Wow. And your reaction to the fact that this finally happened? Well, it's great. I mean, look, if we're focusing on you know, what we should be at this point, there has been so many unanswered questions about this case. And it doesn't matter what part of the uh, of the tap question you're on or anything else or have been, the fact that we've gotten to this point is just wonderful for the Dodge family. And, that, and that's, the, that's the priority. You know, at this point, that's the priority, is we have got more answers today than we have had in the past. And that's, and that's a wonderful place to be. For the first time, the, the, you know, and I adopted this case 19 years into its existence. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, the last few years I've wondered if we'd ever get to this point. You know, the, the idea that this gentleman 
his DNA was not in any kind of a database somewhere, just it's pretty surprising. And so the thoughts that, you know, was he dead, things like that, um, certainly we had thought about it. So, you know, as Carol has mentioned over the years, started losing a little hope that we get to this point. And so very, very exciting development. I think for the first time we're at a place where uh, this case can actually come to a conclusion. You know, the things that were done with TAP a couple of years ago, that wasn't a conclusion. It was a, it was a stoppage of a bunch of events, uh, but ultimately uh, we're at a place where we can get to a conclusion, both you know, in Mr. TAP's case as well as, as well as the Dodge homicide specifically. You mentioned the fact that his DNA isn't in any database. One would imagine that to allegedly commit a crime this horrific, do you think he might have done this elsewhere? I've got no evidence to that, to that effect. Uh, and certainly there is nothing on this case that is um, ever going to surprise me in terms of, of how something could or should play out. The fact of the matter is he was not in any felony DNA database as they've begun doing over the last uh, several years. And so the fact of the matter is, is um, he hasn't been convicted of any crime like that. Chris Tapp, you brought it up two years ago. You kind of were responsible for getting him out of prison, right? Are you kind well, of... Well, you had his attorney, uh, John Thomas. You had uh, those advocacy groups that were you know, pushing to that end, and, and, and they raised a lot of good questions. You know, they really did. Uh, we were in a difficult spot at the time because the, the legal standard for me to review at that point is, was there clear and convincing evidence of innocence? At that point, there just wasn't. Just, they're just opinions. Um, but I felt at that time, you know, certainly there were a lot of questions raised, and I'm not going to suggest otherwise. I've conceded that uh, for years. Uh, a lot of questions raised. And so based on that, we, gave, we came to a conclusion where we, where we gave some a level of finality to the various pending issues he had going on. And I had hoped, maybe, maybe just hoped in my own mind, that uh, we could refocus the energy back toward Angie and back towards the homicide rather than uh, simply dealing with him. Um, and I will tell you, watching the police department uh, work up and work this case over the last couple of years, up to and including what was done over the last couple of weeks, was just phenomenal. Just phenomenal work. And, and the dedication they've had that I've seen them focus on, we don't care what answers were given, we simply want to get to the truth. And that, that was as refreshing as I've seen. Uh, they, they've worked it hard, you just can't give them enough credit. Uh, to the point where I think we're finally at a place where this is going to come to some conclusion. And I'm excited about that. So two years ago, uh, you work with TAPS attorneys and the other organizations to get him out of prison. Chris Tapp still has on his record a murder conviction. Sure. What happens now with him? Well, there may be some legal things that go on with regard to his folks. I don't know at this point. I will tell you what I can do or not do. Uh, right now, uh, as I've stated before, we're, we're going to go through the process of vetting the information. As everybody's aware, uh, Mr. Drips, as this is public information, he uh, says he acted alone. I think I have an obligation to ensure that that information is accurate. I mean, if there's ever a case to to stand for the proposition that we ought to vet uh, folks' statements, that's certainly this one. So we're going we're to do that process. I expect that to be done very quickly. Uh, both the chief and I have dedicated uh, manpower to answering that because that also, you know, that answers questions with regard to the current homicide case we have. And so those things work, you know, they work together. Uh, an answer to one answers the other. And so they're going to vet that information. Uh, what I, same situation I was in a couple of years ago, uh, where I didn't feel like there was clear and convincing evidence of innocence, because again, they're just, they're just opinions. They were good opinions, but they were opinions. Um, right now, there's an appearance that there's new information. Uh, an ethical obligation for a prosecutor is, is that if there is clear and convincing evidence of innocence, the prosecutor must seek to remedy that conviction. Uh, if, that tur if that turns out to be the case, uh, then that's my obligation going forward with regard to Mr. Tapp. So that would exonerate him. If, if that's what you find, you could exonerate him here within a matter of weeks. It's wiped off his record. 
does he then have the option to possibly enter litigation with the state, sue the state? Well, whether he, whether he sues the city or not, it's not my, not my concern. Uh, my obligation is to, uh, if his conviction is justified, fine. If it is not, I must remedy it. That's my obligation and that's what I'll do. Whether it has any uh, side effects from it is, is not an issue for me to consider. All right, well, is there anything that you want to say, anything we didn't miss, any message you have for the public concerning all of this? Well, you, look, there are people that have been on various sides of this question for a long time, uh, and everyone, you know, very understandable in their own right. Um, I don't have any such, such luxury to be, you know, dedicated to one opinion or the other. At the end of the day, I simply have to do uh, what the evidence tells me to do. Um, if that uh, previously convicted Mr. Tal you know, you and I have talked about this. I was in college when this happened, um, you know, and I inherited this thing a couple of years ago. And in the course of my experience, I have, we got a, an investigation done on it. Uh, we reached an agreement to let him out of jail. A lot of folks were unhappy about that. Um, certainly the thing that happened a couple of years ago, no one loved. You know, everyone kind of, I think I said at the time it was a, a pragmatic solution to an ideolo ideological problem. Uh, but it came, came to a stoppage so that we, I think, could refocus on, on the case. I think that's been done, and so I'm pleased with that. Um, but the truth's going to dictate whatever decisions I make. The evidence is going to dictate uh, the decisions I make. And if they, if they exonerate Mr. Taplin, so be it. Um, because that's what I think society demands from our system, and we've got to get it right. Even if it's been done wrong, it's got to be done right. Well, we'll be watching. I'm sure everyone out there will be watching because this story has not only gripped people here in eastern Idaho, but all over the country. Danny Clark, thank you very much. The prosecutor for Bonneville County, thank you for watching.